This is James Lindsay, and you are listening to New Discourses Bullets. Today, I want to give you a short explanation of how they actually go about transforming education. You see, our education system has been transformed. In fact, I think our education system has been stolen from our children and our society uh, by activists who want to repurpose education in the most kind of hidden or surreptitious way into something else. In fact, into a radicalization program in terms of woke politics. And so this is what we do on New Discourses Bullets, is summarize something in a short bullet point fashion, one topic you need to understand about woke Marxism. And I want you to understand how they transform education, and I mean it, how they do this, uh, so that you're going to be able to start helping or figuring out how you might actually get this stopped, because it's very difficult. You could ask to see the curriculum, the curriculum's going to look fine. Uh, but the reason is that they're, they're using what are called a Frarian generative themes approach. What they want to do is they want to generate particular conversations, political conversations, and then guide them to particular answers, particular uh, ways of thinking about issues. And they can use any lesson at all. Paulo Freire, who was a Brazilian Marxist who designed this approach uh, in the 1960s, 1970s, and 1980s, uh, what he did was, was redesigned reading programs. He used uh, what the generative themes method, he called it, to what he did was he interviewed uh, the people he was going to teach, and he to teach to read specifically. And he found out words that were kind of radicalizing or triggering words, and he called them generative words. And then what he did was he fed them back to the people in a way that would radicalize them through using pictures or drawings, or you know maybe you could imagine short films or whatever, but he used pictures and drawings primarily. And he used those to get people to see the conditions of their lives in the way that he wanted to see them, which is from the Marxist perspective. Then he would tack on the word for the thing they're looking at. Maybe it was a slum or whatever. So he'd draw a picture of a slum, which he picked up from talking to them. Yeah, we live in slums. And then so he would take the word, he would take an image of the slum, show them the slum, then add the word slum. And allegedly he's teaching them to read the word slum in relationship to the image. But the real purpose was to have a discussion that actually teaches them about slums from the Marxist perspective that he wants to have. He wants them to understand that they were created by the government or by the bourgeoisie or the power or whatever that needs to be uh, questioned and challenged and overthrown. As a matter of fact, that was the goal, is to get the slum dwellers to see that if they came together as a political class who understood they were being screwed over by other people, that it was other people's fault, then they could overthrow the system. It's not about, say, getting educated to learn how to you know read or whatever so that you can go get a good job and climb out of the slum. The goal is to get those people to become radicals who destroy the conditions that create the slum altogether, which he believed resided in communism. So today we're going to look at this in a more modern context, and we're going to do a word problem. I know we all love mathematics, but we're going to do a math word problem. Actually, technically we're not going to do a math word problem because I'm going to show you a number of ways that that math word problem can be hijacked and turned into a generative themes lesson into all kinds of politics from the most innocuous looking question. If you saw this on your child's homework, you would never, ever, ever suspect that it's a inappropriate introduction to a political lesson. And that's how these people operate. That's how they're actually doing what they're doing in education and getting away with it under the noses of Republican state legislatures and so on. Now, I have to give credit to a woman named Jennifer McWilliams, who was a former educator who is now taking on social emotional learning quite head on. And this word problem and how it gets used actually comes from her experience. It turns out this is a second grade level word problem. And she presented it at a talk I recently attended in Franklin, Tennessee, and found to be uh, very illuminating. And I asked, with her permission, if I could share it with my audience. And she was enthusiastic and agreeing. So here's the word problem. This is second grade math. Stop sweating. You'll be okay. And in fact, like I said, we're not even going to do the math. We're not even going to get to the math. And that's actually the point. That's why your kids can't do math. That's why your kids can't read or write at grade level. Statistically speaking, only about a third of them can. And the reason is because they never actually complete the lessons because they go into the political discussion and then the lesson isn't that important. So here's the word problem. Johnny is riding in the car on the way to an amusement park with his mom and dad. 
The amusement park is 50 miles away. They have already driven 30 miles. How much further is there to go to get to the amusement park? So this is a very easy question. If you're if you have word problem anxiety, you still know the answer is 30, or sorry, is 20 miles. It's 50 minus 30 equals 20. So this is not a uh, hard question. This is a second grade math question. But here's how the generative or Frarian or social emotional learning trained teacher, because those are all really mostly synonymous. This is how they're going to present that to the students. They'll, they'll, they'll read the question or they'll put it up on, a, on the projector or something probably put it up on the projector, and they'll say, before we look for the answer class, let's get engaged with the material. They love the word engagement. They might not say it to the kids, but that's the mentality, is they want to increase engagement by having a dialogue about it. And this makes sense with little kids. So they might say something like, before we uh, look for the answer to this, this question, before we do the math, let's pause. How many of you guys have ever been to an amusement park? And so now you're getting the kids interested in the question, which is why it's framed in terms of an amusement park in the first place, I guess. And so you're going to get the kids excited. And the kids are all going to raise their hand because second graders love to talk about themselves and the things that they've done. Maybe, uh, you know, half or whatever of the class raises their hand that they've been to an amusement park and about half doesn't. And now you can actually see where there's about to be a lever for politics. Oh, I see some of you guys have been to the amusement park and some of you haven't. Why maybe would that be the case? How come some of you have gone and some of you haven't? And some of them might say something like, I don't know what an amusement park is because they're seven. Some of them might say, my parents won't take me. Some of them might say, I'm scared of the rides. Some of them might say, my parents want to wait until I'm older. And every one of those, by the way, you can see very easily becomes a political discussion if they want to take it. But eventually somebody might say, and they might angle for this, well, some people can't afford to go to the amusement park. And now you're having a, po a conversation about poverty. You heard about three different hooks where you could have a question about parental versus childhood authority discussions. Who, who has the say, the child or the parent? My parents think I, need to, I, I can't go until I'm older. Well, is it right that your parents decide that? Why do some kids get to go at a younger age and other kids don't? Maybe your parents, uh, you know, are controlling you. You could, I mean, that's a bit extreme, but you could, you can see where that goes. And that's what the point of this discussion is. Um, but in this case, the poverty comes up. Some people cannot afford to go to an amusement park. Well, why not? Well, some people are too poor. It's very expensive. They cost a lot of money, whatever. And you're having a discussion about poverty, which very, very quickly becomes, well, why are some people poor and why aren't? some people poor? Why are some people rich and some people poor? And then we're not even answering the very easy word problem. They're not learning math yet. Now we're talking about why some people might be poor and some people might not be poor. This is a political discussion now with second graders. In the context, the idea was that we are doing math class, we're learning word problems, we're learning subtraction, and here we are now having a political discussion that has nothing to do with that that's been tabled. This is supposed to increase engagement and interest, but we're not. The word problem has been forgotten. We're talking about why some kids are rich and some kids are poor, or why some families are rich and poor, right? And so somebody might mention, I mean, there's, there's, this could be the entire day could be spent on poverty. The entire month could be spent on poverty. And it could go down a classical Marxist route. It could go down a welfare state route. There are lots and lots of route places it could go. But it could also easily bleed into, well, you know, somebody might say something like, some race, some people are, are, you know, white people have more money or, you know, some racial uh, correlation to poverty. So it could easily bleed into race or other identity discussions. You know, it could be, you know, in any sense that somebody might be considered marginal. The teacher might suggest some of these. They might, if they're very savvy, wait until a student prompts that idea because then it's a generative theme that came from the student. So then they have to address it. If anybody questions, why did you bring up race? I didn't bring up race. One of the students brought up race, so I thought it was a pertinent discussion to have. And now you're having a CRT discussion, or a CRT, or you know, a, a discussion where where critical race and Marxism intersect, and kind of the structural and material dimensions. And you're having this discussion with the kids, and then you can lead into, well, what should we do about it? And let the kids offer, you know, make it free. Will that really work? And now you're basically talking about the idea of a welfare state with children in the context of them supposed to be learning a subtraction word problem. And so the math lesson got hijacked and turned, turned into something else. 
most of the time that you might spend on the mathematics, you know, which might have been 10 different word problems, is now going to be eaten up. So they're not practicing doing mathematics or learning to read word problems and turn them into math problems and solve the math problems. They're not doing that anymore. They're not doing mathematical mastery. They're now doing politics. And in particular, in this case, about poverty and or race, where something very easily comes off of, have you ever been to an amusement park as an engaging question? You know, then there's this issue. You know, it says Johnny's riding in the car on the way to an amusement park with his mom and dad. Well, do all families, do, you know, do all of you guys, you know, get to go with your mom and dad? Like, who goes to the amusement park with their moms and dads? Or who goes places with their mom and dad in the car? And then some kids raise their hand, well, I don't have a dad at home. And so now you've got single parent issues. You've got feminism able to come through the door. Somebody might raise their hand and say, well, I don't have a dad at home. We have two moms. Or down the street, somebody has two moms. And now you're having sex, gender, sexuality discussions. What do families look like in the world today? What are different kinds of families? Let's talk about different kinds of families. Okay, mom and dad, that's a kind of family. Uh, but what else is there? Oh, two moms. Oh, two dads. Oh, you know, a small group of uh, people, um, adults, some men and some women, a single mother, a single father. And now they're having these kinds of political discussions with the kids. And again, the context was, we're going to do a mathematics word problem that if you saw it as the parent in your child's homework, you would never suspect that this is the basis for a political discussion. So we've got poverty, we've got race, we've got how other identity categories might intersect with poverty. We've got the idea of different kinds of families. We've got the idea of, well, why would, why would some families have two moms? Oh, well, sometimes two women love each other. And now we're talking about sexuality with second graders because of a math question that's completely innocuous. Here's another one that it could happen. They're driving to the amusement park. Does it, do you guys think it's okay? Do you guys think it's a good, if you have a kind of a more forward teacher that wants to push this issue, the sustainability angle or the environmental angle, do you guys think it's okay that, you know, we get in a car and drive 50 miles? Isn't that a long way? Isn't 50 miles kind of far? Yeah, so you have to drive. And should we drive 50 miles just to have fun? Just so that we can go to an amusement park? Is that a good thing to do? Is that good for the environment? What might be a different choice? Oh, you could play a video game at home instead. Or, you know, or whatever else. And now you're having an environmental discussion. And then, like I mentioned before, you know, did Johnny even want to go? Uh, did his parents make him? Why do some kids get to go at seven years old and other kids have to wait until they're 10? Whatever. What are, let's have a discussion about parental authority. And, you know, where else might your parents have opinions about, you know, you not being old enough? Oh, you're not allowed to see a scary movie. Oh, they don't want you kissing girls or kissing boys. They don't want to talk to you about sex. Well, we have to have sex education here. And you can get into all of these different discussions very easily. And the idea that, you know, parents very often don't know what's best for their kids. And the school is therefore going to step in as experts. All off of this word problem, which seemed very innocuous. Let me read the word problem for you again. Johnny is riding in the car on the way to an amusement park with his mom and dad. The amusement park is 50 miles away. They've already driven 30 miles. How much further is there to go to get to the amusement park? There's no way that any normal person looking at that would see Literally a semester worth of political lessons. Literally a semester worth of political lessons for second graders. But you could end up using just this one question to get the kids by asking them prompting and leading questions. You could get them to bring up all kinds of political topics that you might then have to spend all this time and bleed into, oh, well, you know, in math class today we brought up, you know, how some people can't afford to go to amusement parks and that Black people, you know, very often can't afford to go to amusement parks because of structural racism. And so let's talk in a history class about where structural racism comes from. And now the entire history class is, is oriented toward a social justice or woke Marxist lesson. And this is this hijacking of real curriculum, teaching a kid a math question, is Paulo Freire's generative themes approach. Paulo Freire said that there's no use in learning disconnected syllables or learning to read stupid sentences that are like basic reading, or in this case, learning to solve a basic second grade 
math problem in a word problem format. There's no real point to that. The real point is the political education and that the academic content is a mediator to the political content. And that's what you just saw. This word problem was a mediator to having discussions about poverty, about race, about sex, gender, sexuality, environmentalism, parental authority, all these political topics that the school, that the teachers, the activists posing as teachers might want to use social emotional learning to give the kids the right answer or give the kids the equity lens. They're going to interpret every single one of these things through the equity lens and feed it back into the kids. And then they're going to say, well, I didn't bring up race. This was the word problem. The child brought up race. The child brought up sexuality by saying some parents, some families aren't a mom and a dad. They brought up feminism by saying some parents aren't a mom and a dad. They brought up parental authority by saying some kids get to go to the amusement park when they're seven and others have to wait till they're 10. So we had to talk about those things because they brought it up. In other words, through dialogue with the students, this is Freire's model, through the dialogical method, he called it, through dialogue with the students, we identified generative themes that are emotionally in engaging and otherwise radicalizing for the students to facilitate political discussions that bring them into the awareness of political literacy of, their con of the contexts of their lives. So using innocuous materials that are... That are um, that, that generate these conversations and then guiding, or in Freire's words, facilitating the dialogue to redirect them into political discussions is the Freirean approach. This is what they are doing in education today. This is a theft of education. There is nothing else that it could be called. The theft of education is what this is. They're stealing education from your children to have these political conversations, which are wholly inappropriate or social and emotional conversations that are really the domain of the parents. The school doesn't have the right as the state to step in and have social and emotional education lessons with the children. It's not their role. It is not their job. They have to be as minimal and hands-off and neutral as possible, saying you can't be completely hands-off. You can't never do it. You can't be uh, completely neutral. Saying those things doesn't mean anything. They need to be maximizing the neutrality. They need to be doing the absolute least rather than injecting it on purpose. So when some kid, when they read out the word problem and some kid says, I don't have a mom and dad, you just have to say something like, well, sometimes that's what happens, but we have to work on the math problem right now. And your job as a teacher is to redirect into the academic lesson, not to hijack out of the academic lesson and take up everybody's class time to do political and social and emotional conversations with the children, and you don't have the authority to do that. And in fact, you shouldn't be doing that. But that's what the Frarian method is designed to do. That's how they're stealing your children's education. And when I say stealing your children's education, you need to think of it first and foremost that they are stealing it from your children. But you also have to remember that means they are stealing it from our society. Our future society depends on our children being educated politically indoctrinating them or brainwashing them through this approach is not the same thing. And it is not an improvement. It, in fact, is going to be a gigantic problem down the line. And so the society they live in, the society we age through, is at tremendous risk because they're hijacking Johnny going to an amusement park to have a myriad of political discussions. So I wanted to highlight how this is being done how you might challenge this or take it on, you actually are going to have to catch it, which means you're going to have to see it happening, which is difficult. And let's say we have cameras in the classrooms watching this, the, the, the teachers do this, or they go on their TikTok or whatever other stupid thing and confess to it, brag about it, put out their videos for other educators. This is how I hijack a math word problem question to turn it into a political discussion about gay people or race or poverty or feminism, or parental authority, or childhood innocence, or whatever else. Unless they're, you have to catch them doing it, and you have to show that this is happening. In the meantime, the only thing you can do is protect your children. They shouldn't be going into environments where activists think that this is appropriate. They should not be going into environments where activists think they have the right, that they are entitled to do this with other people's children. That's going to be some hard choices for you, I think. But that's the state of affairs. That is what they've done to education. We're not fixing this overnight. We have to fix it. 
But in the meantime, you must protect your children. 